Hello, and thanks for joining us again after a short hiatus. We plan on releasing new episodes every other week for the rest of the year, and we'll keep making new episodes into the next year. So if you haven't subscribed already, we hope you do. But if you're looking for something interesting to listen to, we hope you go back and check them out, because most of them are self-contained stories. For this week's episode, we're going back to June 1983. On June 2, 1983, Air Canada Flight 797 was flying from Dallas, Texas to Montreal, Quebec with a stopover in Toronto, Ontario. 46 people, 41 passengers, and 5 crew members were on board. As they got close to Cincinnati, Ohio, a fire broke out in one of the bathrooms. The pilots were forced to land at the Cincinnati, Northern Kentucky International Airport. 23 people were killed in the fire. The cause of the fire was never officially determined but it was thought it was electrical fire. Jim Gordon was a popular session drummer in the 1960s and 70s. He played on albums with bands like The Birds, The Carpenters, Crosby, Stills & Nash, Alice Cooper, Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers, John Lennon, B.B. King, and Tom Waits, just to name a few. He also played on one of the greatest albums of all time, Pet Sounds by Beach Boys. Jim was also the drummer for Eric Clapton's blues band, Derek and the Dominoes. Jim Gordon had schizophrenia, but he had been misdiagnosed. On June 3, 1983, he attacked his 72-year-old mother, Osa Marie Gordon. Jim struck her several times with a hammer and then stabbed her to death with a butcher knife. He said that the voices in his head told him to kill her. In July 1984, he was sentenced to life in prison. He was able to apply for parole in 1991, but he was denied. He has been denied parole nine more times since then. Jim Gordon is currently 77 years old and he's incarcerated at the California Medical Facility in Vacaville, California. It's a medical and psychiatric prison. On June 6, 1983, the number one song in the Billboard charts was What a Feeling by Irene Cara from the Flashdance soundtrack. The number one movie was the sequel to Star Wars and the fifth episode in the Star Wars saga, Return of the Jedi. In June 1983, 32-year-old Rachel Cosum lived in San Antonio, Texas with her 8-year-old daughter, Kirsten. Rachel worked as an office manager for an interior design company in Northeast San Antonio. Rachel was a petite woman. She was 5'1 and weighed 130 pounds. June 6, 1983 started off like any other Monday with Rachel going to work but she didn't come home that evening. Around 9.20 p.m., her family called the police. Officers went to her work. They found no signs of a break-in or forced entry. They got inside the small office building and they found the nearly new dead body of 32-year-old Rachel Kosum. She was at the bottom of a staircase that had a banister. Her dress had been ripped open. Her buttocks was in the air and her dress was pulled over her face. Her underwear was missing. Her hands were crossed behind her back and there was residue from an adhesive on her wrists. It was clear that her hands had been bound with some type of tape. Tied around her neck were her pantyhose. They had been cut with something sharp, most likely a knife. Nothing was missing from around the office. Also, Rachel's jewelry had not been stolen. The medical examiner determined that she had probably been murdered sometime between 10 a.m. and 12.30 p.m., but definitely before 5 p.m. The last time anyone talked to Rachel was at 10.30 that morning. She had called an interior designer because a male customer was in the office asking about a ceiling fan. The police believed that since there was no forced entry or signs of a break-in, Rachel let the killer into the office. They thought she might have known the person. Or since it was a place of business, it could have been someone posing as a customer. The medical examiner determined that she had been sexually assaulted and semen samples were collected. 
The cause of death was ligature strangulation. The pantyhose that were tied around her neck had been used to strangle her. There were no defensive marks. The medical examiner thought that there was a logical explanation for this. The pantyhose had been cut with a knife. So the killer probably used the knife to threaten Rachel into not fighting him. By the time he tied the pantyhose around her neck, it was too late to fight back. The first thing the police did was interview sex offenders and people with a history of violence who lived in the area. That turned up no leads or suspects. Unfortunately, with the technology available in 1983, the police didn't have many clues to work with, so the case went cold. Nearly a year went by. Then in May 1984, there was an aggravated robbery and sexual assault in Live Oak, Texas. Live Oak neighbors northeast San Antonio. The police were also investigating a sexual assault that happened in October 1983 in Universal City, which neighbors Live Oak to the east. Both women were attacked while working alone in a small office building. The two women got a look at the attacker and a sketch was developed. The sketch was then released to the public. A man who owned a business called the detective in Live Oak. He said that his secretary recognized the man in the sketch. The detective talked to the secretary. She explained that the man had often loitered around the business and she had a bad feeling about him. She actually had written down his license plate because she felt so uneasy about him. The lead detective on the case looked up the license plate and learned that the car belonged to a man named Mike Dossett. Dossett was a married man and a little league coach without a criminal record. The detective went to Dossett's home and immediately saw that he looked like the sketch. Dossett was brought to the police station. He immediately confessed to the sexual assaults in Live Oak and Universal City. Dossett then told the detective about a recurring dream he had been having for about a year. He said he was standing by a banister at the top of a staircase in an office building. He looked down, and at the bottom of the staircase was the dead body of a woman. She was nude, her buttocks was in the air, and her skirt was pulled over her head. Dawson said he didn't know what happened to the woman, but he knew he had something to do with it. The detective was familiar with Rachel Kosum's case, and he thought that Dawson was describing her crime scene. He got Rachel's case file and learned that Dawson knew details about the crime that had never been made public. The detective then handed Dossett over to the San Antonio police who had jurisdiction over Rachel's case. However, Dossett refused to talk to the detectives. In 1984, Mike Dossett pleaded guilty to two counts of sexual assault and two counts of aggravated robbery. He was sentenced to a total of 25 years in prison. He ended up serving eight years and he was paroled on New Year's Eve 1992. In 1995, 12 years after Rachel's murder, her daughter, Kirsten, called the San Antonio Police Department and asked about the status of her mother's case. It had been cold, but the detective she spoke to decided to reopen it. One well, of the first things he did was track down Mike Dossett. After Dossett was released, he became an active member of the Evangelical Free Church. Two years later, a woman named Linda became associate pastor at the church. She and Mike became romantically involved and were married a year after they met. The detective brought Dossett in for questioning. He was asked about the recurring dream. He initially said he didn't remember the dreams, but he admitted they talked about it with the Live Oak detective. The detective continued to interview Dossett. 
he eventually started talking about the dreams. He said that he saw himself standing by a banister. He saw a dead woman at the bottom of the stairs. She was bound and naked and he couldn't see her face. But from the top of the stairs, he could see out of a window. Later, Dawson talked about what he saw in the dream when he looked out the window. He said he saw a parking lot with bushes on the edge of the property line. He also talked about the banister. He said it was white, two inches wide, and it was curved. All this accurately described the outside of the building and the banister of Rachel's office. Dawson said that back then he had a lot of dreams. He also said there was a part of him that was evil and he couldn't control that part of himself. The detective then asked Dawson if he had ever been in the interior design business where Rachel worked. He said he had been there in February or March 1983, a few months before the murder. He had asked about sponsoring the baseball team he coached. The detective asked if he killed Rachel, and he denied it. Dawson claimed he had nothing to do with her rape and murder. The detective collected some blood, hair, and saliva samples for DNA analysis. The detective then handed the samples over to the crime lab. But there was a problem. The rape kit from Rachel's case was missing. So Dawson's DNA could not be compared to the killer's DNA. The case went cold once again. But the crime lab did keep Dawson's DNA on file. In 2002, 19 years after the murder, the San Antonio police received another call from Rachel's daughter, Kristen. She talked to the cold case investigator. In those 19 years, a lot had changed. In 1983, the biggest movie at the box office was the number one movie when Rachel was killed, Star Wars Return of the Jedi. The second was the Dustin Hoffman-led comedy, Tootsie, and the third was the romantic dance drama, Flashdance. In 1983, the Academy Award for Best Picture went to Gandhi, starring Ben Kingsley in the titular role. In 2002, the top movie was Sam Raimi's Spider-Man, which kickstarted the modern superhero genre. The second was another installment in the Star Wars franchise. It was the second episode, Attack of the Clones. Then the third place film was the second Harry Potter movie, The Chamber of Secrets. Ron Howard's The Beautiful Mind won the Academy Award for Best Picture. In 1983, the three biggest songs were Every Breath You Take by The Police, Billie Jean by Michael Jackson, and the top song when Rachel was murdered, What a Feeling, by Irene Cara. Many things had changed for Michael Jackson during those years. In 1983, he was the undisputed king of pop and Thriller was the biggest album in the world. Thriller went on to sell over 70 million albums, becoming the best-selling album of all time. Ten years later, Michael Jackson was accused for the first time of sexually abusing a young boy. In May 2002, he started filming the controversial documentary Living with Michael Jackson. In the documentary, he discusses holding hands and having sleepover with 12-year-old boys and seeing nothing wrong with his actions. One thing that hadn't changed was that the crime lab still can locate Rachel Cossum's rape kit. Another problem for the cold case investigator was the case file itself. Usually, cold case files are inches thick. Rachel's file only had two or three pages in it and a microfiche. Kirsten was upset by the news, but she remembered the name of the suspect who had talked about dreams he had of the murder, Mike Dossett. So the cold case investigator rebuilt the file by re-interviewing witnesses and talking to other investigators who had worked on the case. In April 2003, the cold case detective went to the medical examiner's office. The chief medical examiner had been there since 1981. The cold case investigator asked if he knew what happened to the rape kit. He did know it was in the freezer. He found it and handed it over to the cold case detective. 
On April 17, 2003, the detectives submitted the kid to the crime lab, but there were problems with the kid. The samples were degraded, and mold, fungus, and bacteria were present. Luckily, they could get enough genetic material to create a DNA profile. The profile was then compared to Mike Dossett's DNA. On June 26, 2003, 20 years and 20 days after Rachel's murder, the cold case investigator got the results. The DNA was a 99.9% .9 match. Mike Dossett was arrested that day and charged with the murder of Rachel Cossum. Dossett went to trial in January 2005. The DNA was the most damaging evidence. The prosecution was also allowed to talk about Dossett's two convictions for rape. Like Rachel, both victims were raped while they were alone in a small office building. Finally, Dossett's statements regarding the dreams were entered into evidence. The trial lasted seven days. The jury found him guilty of first-degree murder. He was sentenced to 40 years in prison. Kirsten said that after all those years, it felt like a weight had been lifted off her shoulders. In Texas, inmates can be paroled with good behavior after serving 25% of their sentence. This would have allowed Dossett to be paroled after 10 years. If he had been free before his trial, he would have been eligible for parole in January 2005. Mike Dossett is no longer registered in the Texas Department of Criminal Justice Database, so he was paroled at some point. According to public records, he's 74 years old and lives in San Antonio, Texas. Thank you so much for listening to this week's episode. Once again, if you have a case you want to suggest, please visit our website, criminallylisted.com. But that's all for today. Thank you again for listening. Please stay safe and take care of yourself.